thank you for the organizers uh, for the opportunity to present this work here. Um, I'm going to present two pieces of work today. Uh, the first is brand new. It will come out as an IMF working paper within a week or two, and it is empirical work on the future of the world oil market. And the second um, uh, part will be about a, a slight extension of the WIO work that I presented here in October uh, last year that's using the IMS global economic model uh, to think about different scenarios for the future of the world economy. Here's the usual disclaimer. So by way of introduction, um, when it comes to predicting future oil prices, uh, conventional models have great difficulties with that. And when I say conventional models, uh, I mean uh, uh, econometric models that are out there that have tried to, pr uh, uh, to forecast oil prices, also surveys of expectations, futures markets. They cannot consistently beat a random walk, and, ra and a random walk says that the best predictor of tomorrow's oil price is today's oil price. So that's not a very good forecasting performance. Um, and part of the reasons for the, uh, reason for that is that econometric models tend to pay very little attention to oil supply. Um, that has two problems. First, they cannot capture temporary oil shocks um, very well. But more importantly, especially at the current juncture, they cannot predict an upward trend in the oil price because these models uh, tend to be demand-based and mean-reverting mo models that will always predict that the oil price goes back to some level and to have a trend that persists over a decade, which is almost what we have uh, by now, uh, is hard to explain for such a model. The alternative is to take um, the uh, geological limits to the oil supply uh, more seriously than these models do, um, and then uh, the oil supply constraints are front and center for determining the future of oil production, but then in that case, there's no role for oil prices. And as I will show you, this is also not consistent with recent data. So what is needed is something that's in between, and the model that I will present in this paper uh, combines both approaches where geological limits will turn out to be very important for the, to explain the upward trend in oil prices uh, that we're in the middle of, uh, but demand shocks through higher prices, by causing higher prices, can increase production as well. And that is also something that we have observed, as I will show you. Um, in, because this is a statistical model that we evaluate with state-of-the-art techniques, we can then say something about the uncertainty uh, about shocks and also about key parameters uh, that we can then directly evaluate. Uh, a few words about historical forecasts of world oil production. The point of the exercise is I will show you uh, that the mainstream view has tended to overestimate where oil production is going. The uh, peak oil view has tended to slightly underestimate where it's going. And these have been coming together like this. They're still very far apart, but they have been coming together. Um, and so here are the EIA's uh, projections uh, made between 2001 and 2010. And it's a bit hard to see because there's so many of them, but it's an almost continuous downward revision year by year by year. These are projections out to 2020 with different starting points, right? These are the different years in which the projections were made. An almost continuous revision by a very large amount of more than 25 million barrels a day in 2020. So this, these are very large numbers. This started in 2003. What happened in 2003? In 2003, the official OPEC spare capacity took a nosedive. This was in early 2000. This was around the time of the Iraq War. Um, and that triggered the beginning of this upward spike in oil prices that lasted all the way to the beginning of the Great Recession. It then dropped, and this was because there was demand destruction, and spare capacity went up. But now look at, what's, look at what's happening. Spare capacity is trending down again, and oil prices are trending up again. And so that's the, the picture as far as the official view is concerned. Here are three of Colin Campbell's forecasts. It's a slightly different aggregate of oil. It's regular conventional oil. This, these are the actuals again. And these three lines are three different forecasts made between 2003 and 2010. And they, and again until 2020, uh, and there's a slight upward drift in those forecasts as well. Uh, not as well, uh, in, in those forecasts. So this, this goes the other way from the official view. Uh, now, uh, Colin Campbell's work is very much uh, uh, um, 
bottom up, looking at individual oil fields uh, with, with a lot of engineering knowledge. Uh, there's another approach that uh, proponents of the peak oil view have used. That's uh, a curve fitting, the DeFay model. Uh, that was done in 2005 with data up till 2003, predicting this curve here and this production profile here uh, for future oil production. What happened, because we just saw the data in 2003, what happened from that year onwards is that oil prices jumped up and look what happened. Uh, there's significant deviations from the phase forecast from that, from that line uh, um, that have lasted to the present day. But these deviations uh, nevertheless have not led us to resume the historic growth rates. They have kept us on a plateau. So we want something in the middle of this. And so we built a model that I do not have time to uh, go into great detail about. The only thing um, that I want to say is that we basically built a model with demand and supply curves <coughs> for the world oil market where the demand curve specification is very conventional. Then there's another set of equations for potential GDP and uh, the output gap, excess demand, all that is conventional. The supply curve is not in that it combines the DeFay specification of the peak oil view, which is called Hubbard linearization, with price sensitivity of oil supply, where higher prices can make the oil supply go up over time. And that is basically the combination of both views. And uh, have a look at what that does to the forecast accuracy of our model. And so here, the table, I'm sorry, it's a little bit small. I should have made this bigger. But I'll, t I'll tell you what's happening in words. These are out of sample forecasts for our model versus the closest competitor out there. Um, and, and these are one year, two year, up to five year ahead forecasts. And what is shown here is the root mean square error. So when those lumber numbers are large, it means the forecast is bad, relatively speaking. And what we're seeing is that for the real price of oil, our model does better than the random walk at any horizon. And especially at longer horizons, the, the forecast error is a quarter of the random walk. And as I told you earlier, the random walk is something that conventional models have difficulty beating. Um, for oil production, uh, these are the EIA forecast uh, root mean square errors. And these are our models. And our models are about half of what the EIA's forecast errors are. Uh, and so again, on oil production, the model does very much better. I'm not going to go into the GDP uh, numbers. Here's a little story. This is a decomposition of history where we're saying, let's start in 2002. Let's run our, our model forward from that point onwards. And this red line is running it forward without any shocks. And this blue line is running it forward with the estimated shocks. We estimated we're using Bayes Bayesian nonlinear estimation techniques. This is high tech stuff. Uh, where, and, and this basically is the model with all shocks that fits the actual evolution of oil prices. And these blue lines and these other subplots decompose the contribution of different shocks to what happened to overall oil price deviations from this trend. Now, the critical thing is that this trend, even without any shocks, is up. And that is because of the Hubbard feature in, uh, in the supply curve, meaning that even if no oil demand or oil supply shocks hit this economy, on the basis of estimates up till 2002, this model would have predicted an upward drift in oil price because of this peaking uh, 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 nature of the supply curve. But then there were significant deviations. And wh wh where did they come from? Well, there were oil demand shocks uh, in, in the early part of the 2000s as the economy was doing well, and also output gap shocks uh, a little bit towards the later part of that period, but mostly oil demand shocks as the world economy was booming. But then from 2005 to 2008, and also more recently, uh, the last one or two years, oil supply shocks explain a lot of the action in the actual oil price relative to the trend. And that, what happened in 2005, we reached the plateau in world oil production. And we've been on it ever since. Right? Uh, and, and so this is uh, beginning to have a big additional effect. Uh, and output gap shocks. The, 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 the great uh, recession led to demand destruction, and that is largely explained by output gap shocks. Let me skip over this one in the interest of time. Um, so that was forecast, uh, um, out, of, out of sample forecast in history. Now what we're doing is let's take history as given, and let's say, what does the future hold? Right? So we're saying we're in 2011. 
We have estimated this model up to here with uncertainty about shocks and parameters, etc. What does the future hold? Well, uh, the, the, the point forecast of our model over the next, uh, this is actually nine, nine years, not 10 years, but roughly 10 years, has output growth of, of roughly 0.9% per annum. And if you look at the very latest EIA forecast, it's in the ballpark. That's more or less uh, what they project. Um, but I want you to also notice that there are very wide error bands around this. They reflect our uncertainty about uh, what are going to be ultimately recoverable reserves and elasticities of demand <coughs> and supply. And uh, the uh, flat output path for the next 10 years is, is within the 90% uh, uh, confidence interval. But let's not concentrate on that for now. Uh, let's focus on the next one, which tells us, okay, what oil prices are going to be necessary to make this happen, to make this 0.9% output increase happen. What the model tells us, again, with great uncertainty, because there's so much we do not know about the oil market, but our best guess is that the real oil price has to nearly double over the next decade. It's a little less than double on the point forecast, but it is, is, is in the ballpark of ha having to nearly double. And this is because um, we're always working against this geological constraint now that, is, that wants to drive production down. And if demand is to, uh, is to be satisfied through supply, it can only happen through high, higher prices that have to, that have to be quite significant. Um, and depending on if you had, for example, very much lower elasticities, you would move to this part of the, of, of the confidence bands to even higher uh, oil prices. And, you know... Uh, given the historic performance of our, of our model in forecasting oil prices out of sample, this is something that we are taking somewhat seriously. Okay? Uh, conclusions. Uh, the objective was to evaluate a model that encompasses two diametrically opposite views of the oil market, the resource constraint view uh, and the view that prices are ultimately decisive, uh, which is the economist's view. Um, the model performance uh, in terms of history, our decomposition into trends and shocks is very plausible. It tells a story that is intuitively, intuitively sounds right. For forecasting, we have a far better performance than competing models. Uh, what do the forecasts say? Uh, we, first of all, the EIA's latest forecast of 0.9% uh, annual supply growth may be feasible, but the real oil prices would have to nearly double over the next decade. Uh, but that's subject to very large parameter uncertainty. Um, and then there's one very important thing here. Um, the effects on GDP are here in this model, and I didn't discuss them uh, very, uh, very much. There are effects, negative effects of higher oil prices on GDP, but they're not enormous. They don't make the economy collapse. Um, and that's based on historical data where it's kind of hard to argue that that has ever been the case. Right? There have been temporary blips, but to say... We, we have very little to go on in the data that would tell us a very persistent supply constraint would lead to a big collapse in GDP. We don't, we don't know that, right? Um, and our model tells us the effects on GDP on the basis of the data are not too dramatic. But there may, what we've, we uh, think that there may be nonlinear effects on GDP once oil prices breach a certain pain barrier. But we don't know what that is. And so our our uh, future research will be very much on that question. Now, that's where I'm connecting to the, the WIO uh, that um, came out last year, uh, and, and, and I'm going to present a succinct uh, version of the simulations that were in there, because what we're doing there is we're basically using a model laboratory-style environment of our global economic model that we're always using for policy analysis, not for forecasting, but for policy analysis, scenario analysis, etc., cetera, um, of which I am responsible for the theoretical development, and the latest theoretical development is to put oil in there. Um, and so we need to understand two questions about oil. What it, first, what is the outlook for production and prices? And I just talked about that, uh, and, and um, uh, we, there's more work to be done here, but we have at least some idea now. The other question concerns GDP. How, and, and I talked about that at the end of the previous uh, uh, paper. How might oil scarcity affect output? Uh, the WIO gave some very tentative answers, but we feel that we'll need a lot more work. So uh, a brief overview of uh, uh, 
the GIMF oil version. GIMF is a choice theoretic dynamic business cycle model. Uh, as I said, it's very frequently used at the IMF for all sorts of purposes. I only want to talk about the, how the specification that I'm going to use today differs from a version without oil. We have an oil demand function uh, where there is a very low short run and long run elasticity of substitution between oil and other factors of production. A low cost share because that's what the data say. This is also what the data say. The output contribution of oil is, is equal to the cost share in the baseline, but we then experiment with um, a version where oil makes actually a very much bigger contribution to output than its cost share would indicate. And there's, there's a, there is a uh, a justifiable, academically justifiable specification of aggregate production in the model uh, that makes sense of that assumption. For oil supply, we treat oil as an exhaust exhaustible resource whereby it's mostly an exogenous endowment, but there is a price response uh, with an elasticity, uh, price elasticity of supply of 0.03, so that's low. The price response is low. We have five scenarios. Um, First one is reduction in oil output growth by 1% per annum relative to trend. This would be going from 1.8% per annum to 0.8%. The alternative one is to have these larger output contributions of oil. So if I don't have enough oil, it makes much more difference to how much output I can produce. Alternative two is to have a reduction in oil output growth by 3.8% per annum, which would take us to an absolute decline of 2% per annum which is sort of like the more pessimistic peak oil scenarios are, that I've seen are, are more or less that order of magnitude. Then, and that's, this is the wheel up to here, uh, and just for the sake of argument and sort of to drive home uh, what's at stake, I, for this presentation, just combined alternative one and two and, uh, 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 to, to go through what the model tells us what would happen there. And then, I, then I've also combined this alternative three with a zero elasticity of substitution uh, between oil and other factors of production, um, j just to have an extreme case uh, to illustrate uh, what, what would happen. Now, so here we have all these scenarios in one graph, and from the baseline to it gets worse as, as I go down this list. And what we have here is uh, uh, GDP absorption and current account for oil exporters for the rest of the world. Here we have the oil supply, the price of oil, and the real interest rate. And so, first of all, uh, the output effects range from 0.2% per annum <coughs> less growth to over 2% per annum in the worst uh, case scenario. Uh, but these, these scenarios are really much worse than what's in the wheel. Um, the, the worst one that was in the wheel had a 0.75%, I believe, uh, roughly, uh, uh, annual loss of growth over these 20 years uh, in, in the projection. Um, so that's, that's one thing. The current account effects in the, in the oil importing countries, uh, for less than 2% of GDP in the baseline to 10% of GDP in this somewhat crazy last scenario that I'm putting out here. So I don't want you to take that too seriously. This is just sort of playing with the model and say, if there really wasn't a substitution possibility between oil and other factors of production, how bad could it get? Right? Um, and uh, next, uh, the price of oil. The baseline uh, for the price of oil, which is that blue line, is actually relatively close to what I've just shown you in that empirical model. 100% um, uh, after 10 years and another 100% after 20, 20 years uh, for different reasons. The models are not strictly comparable, but it sort of gives me comfort, comfort that I might be in the ballpark uh, with, uh, with the baseline. Uh, but that, those are already very large numbers for the increase in the oil price. This green dotted line is what we also had in the WIO, 800% after uh, 20 years. That is a number that is so large that I think, no, uh, in my mind, there is no doubt that there must be some nonlinearities for output, but the model doesn't have those nonlinearities. So the model just basically says, well, there's an output effect, yes, but most of the effect of oil scarcity is sky high prices. Right? If you had a link from these sky high prices to more of an effect on output, then you would get uh, demand destruction, destruction of demand for oil at, on a larger scale. Um, the final point. Uh, real interest rate, don't even look at the, the bottom two lines, they're just too crazy. Um, uh, what would happen is 
when this uh, uh, large increase in revenues to oil exporters happens, we assume in the model that they accumulate that in an oil fund, that they don't spend right away. This will lead to a, a very large increase in world savings, and that increase in world savings for given world investment would drive down the world real interest rate to a point where um, uh, the real interest rate would become so low that nominal interest rates would have to sink to close to zero, meaning monetary policy would be constrained by the zero lower bound on nominal interest rate. So apart from leading to all sorts of current account imbalances, it would also lead to problems for monetary policy if, if the worst case scenarios were to happen. So the conclusion, uh, the oil price effect in the benchmark is similar to our empirical paper. Output and current account effects in the benchmark are modest. Um, the alternatives introduce assumptions that could lead to much larger effects. But these are, at this point, they are just sort of, we're just playing in a laboratory style model environment and we link to, need to link that to data more and that's, that's what we're starting to work on. Um, the output effects get larger but are still not enormous, but the oil price effects are enormous under those alternative assumptions. And the key question, just like at the end of the, the previous paper is, at what level does the output response to higher oil price uh, prices become non-linear in the real world because in the model it is approximately linear. And that's all I have. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you.